Well, good afternoon. I really want to thank Advent Health uh, for, for hosting us here in, in Seminole County. Uh, I also want to thank uh, uh, the great group of folks we have assembled uh, here today to talk about uh, uh, some issues that, that may not have been on the uh, front burner in the public consciousness over these last few months, but uh, I think are going to be very, very significant uh, going forward. Uh, so, of course, we have the First Lady who's done an awful lot in the field of, of mental health, um, even with um, a baby up at 3 a.m. She's still uh, here, ready to go. Uh, we have um, a Tim Cook, who's the CEO here of Advent Health in Altamont Springs. want to thank Tim. Uh, I have Sheriff Dennis Lima, who's just been a champion uh, in terms of fighting uh, substance abuse and, and supporting programs to help mental health. Uh, two of our uh, warriors in the uh, administration, Chad Popple at DCF and Simone Marsteller uh, at D uh, Department of Juvenile Justice. They've worked incredibly hard. Um, they've been very, very effective uh, dealing with a lot of very, very significant and challenging issues. So I want to thank that. We have Maria Bledsoe, CEO of Central Florida Cares Health System, Inc. So thank you, Maria, uh, for being here today. Uh, Andre Bailey, CEO of, of Project Opioid. And so we've, uh, we've worked together before. Uh, uh, Stacy, Stacy Heath is Lieutenant Seminole County Sheriff's Office is doing great work uh, on these issues. And then uh, Dr. Sanjay Patani uh, here in the ED uh, at Advent Health. And he's uh, he has a broken leg, but he's still shouldering <laughs> on and uh, making doing doing what we need to do. So we really thank you. We want to discuss uh, the impact uh, that the pandemic has had on on mental health, but particularly on substance abuse. Uh, the if you went back a year, most people would say that the opioid abuse was one of the most significant issues. As we got into the pandemic, it seemed like concerns with that kind of faded. Uh, the issue didn't fade though, and the issue didn't go away. And so we want to, while we, of course, can continue to deal with the coronavirus pandemic, uh, we should acknowledge that um, this pandemic has probably made some of these other issues more challenging. And these are not issues that are, that are going to go away. They're going to be perennial, and they're going to continue to be challenging. I, I will note, I think that if you look um, uh, in terms of the coronavirus uh, outlook in the state of Florida today, uh, we had, for new cases, the lowest uh, percent positive that we've had since the middle of June. Uh, if you look at the ED visits for COVID-like illness, uh, they're as low as they've been since the middle of June. Uh, if you look at the hospital census, uh, continues to decline uh, up and down the state uh, in terms of COVID-positive patients. And so um, uh, th those are all good trends. Those are all positive uh, signs. You're still going to be something that we're going to deal with. Uh, but, you know, I put in perspective when you look at what we're talking about with substance abuse. Right now in the state of Florida, we've got about 6,000 COVID positive patients who are hospitalized. And not all of them are hospitalized being treated for COVID. Some are incidentally positive who are hospitalized for something else. Uh, but you know, out of 21 and a half million people, you have about 6,000. It's important. Uh, we obviously deal with it. But just last month, there was what, 60 some thousand overdoses in the state of Florida. And that's up significantly year over year uh, uh, from where we were. We've seen overdose deaths increase uh, over these last uh, few months. And this is having a profound effect and it's affecting a very broad reach of people in the state of Florida. Uh, so, so we've got to dig in. Uh, we've got to be able to, to juggle multiple balls. We've got to be able to handle more than one problem when it comes to healthcare. And um, I think the hospitals have shown yeah, they've handled the coronavirus very well. When they needed something, we obviously helped. But, um, but they've done a good job on that. And uh, we're going to continue to be supportive on that. But we also got to be supportive on these, on these other key issues because uh, they're going to be there. Now, um, the First Lady's uh, Hope for Healing initiative is something that um, has really sought to uh, address mental health in the state of Florida. You know, we have, if you look across all our agencies, uh, over $2 billion uh, get allocated uh, for mental health and substance abuse programs just this year. Um, and they're in DJJ, they're in DCF, they're in these, these, these different agencies. But it's, but it's really important. And uh, they were reminding me about the 400000 that made it through this budget year. Um, not a lot made it through. I mean, we vetoed a billion dollars because we were at a much different fiscal situation than we were just a few, uh, few months uh, before I signed the budget. Uh, but I think it's a testament that this was something that, 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 that is viewed positively and is important. Mm -hmm. And so we're glad that we were able uh, to, to do that. Um, and so uh, here's some statistics for just um, 
Seminole County in terms of what we're dealing with here. We've actually seen an increase in suicides uh, by about 35%. Uh, we've seen overdose um, increase by 51% and overdose deaths increase uh, by 15% year to date uh, over and over. Um, and, and it's not just for adults, although there is a lot of, of adults, but when we had school campuses closed, uh, it was a difficult transition for a lot of parents, but also was very difficult on many children. Uh, they weren't able to interact with friends, classmates, and teachers, extracurricular activities, all those. Uh, uh, accordingly, the department uh, saw a big decrease in reports of child abuse because the folks who were there with them every day in the classrooms and in these extracurricular activities are some of the front lines who will report uh, this. And so uh, I know Seminole County is, is back in and uh, you know, we, we, we obviously support you know, the, the, the approach that they've had, but there are just so many different things that, have, um, that, that, are, that are emanating from this that uh, we, we've, we've just gotta, we've gotta have really a community-wide approach. And I think one of the things that Central Florida has done a good job, you guys have had the private sector involved. You're working with your healthcare providers, you're working with community leaders, the law enforcement, uh, understanding that this is not just kind of, you know, one part of society deals with it. You really gotta have all hands on deck. Um, uh, I think you guys got, you, you know, had a lot of momentum going before the pandemic. I think you guys were doing it the right way. I think the pandemic has just set us back um, so, okay, let's regroup um, and let's go forward and, and, and get where we need to go. So I'm, I'm really happy to be here. Uh, I, I look forward to the discussion. Uh, I'm going to kick it over to, uh, to the First Lady uh, to be able to, uh, to make some comments, and then we'll, uh, we'll go around and, and hear from everybody, and then maybe after that we can chat a little bit. Yeah, well, um, I, I appreciate everybody being here today, of course, the media for being here to cover this because um, – this isn't getting as much coverage as we would hope. I mean, we're talking about lives when the governor invoked uh, 63,534. Those were overdoses between July of 2019 to July of 2020. That's an increase. We saw 60, a 28% increase, 63,534. That's 63,534 souls. Those are lives who are in crisis right now that we need to make sure uh, that they know that there are avenues to help, that they need to know that we're thinking about them, um, that this too will pass and that we need to make sure that, um, that they get meaningful help. Um, just last week, uh, the governor, I know many of you know that we are uh, new parents again. We have a four month old baby who, as the governor uh, invoked a second ago, is still not sleeping through the night. So I was up at 4 a.m., 3 a.m., 11 a.m., reading articles and taking notes, but we also have a three year old we have a two-year-old. So, um, you know, for us, of course, how this impacts Floridians across the board is something that we, we think about and talk about frequently. Um, this also impacts, um, and we think about our children. I mean, what is happening to our children, we need to make sure that that is part of the conversation every day. And coming from two parents of two very small children, uh, this really hits home for us, as it does with so many Floridians across the state. Uh, just last week, we were in Sarasota County, and we were uh, talking with the secretary who joined us, Secretary Popple, and we were talking about the child crisis hotline. And what that is is a hotline for people to call in to report suspected child abuse. Well, we're seeing a decrease in calls, which some would say over the summer, oh, well, that's typical. But this has been going on since March where they're seeing a decrease in calls. And why is that? Well, that's because our first responders, our wonderful teachers across the state, we're not there to watch and protect over these children. So when we say we saw a 40% decrease in calls into the child hotline to report suspected abuse, that's 17,000 children that potentially are going unwatched, who are victims of abuse, who are in homes right now with no outlet and no one to help them. And so when we come here and we're trying to raise awareness about this, we thank the media for doing this because it's without recognizing that there is a significant problem that we won't be able to address it. Uh, so 40% decrease in the child crisis hotline calls, 44% decrease in child abuse investigations, 32% decrease in sexual abuse investigations, 50% decrease in physical wow. abuse investigations. It's sad when you talk about those numbers, but then when you know that you're talking about a baby and you're talking about children who can't always fight for themselves, it takes on a whole new meeting. 
So you couple what we've been seeing with the stress and the fear of COVID, and then you add it to what we're seeing with the CDC. And they came out just recently, I think in the last week, with some mental health statistics that were alarming too. We're looking at, um, I think it was 25% of children ages 18 to 25 who have considered and thought about committing suicide in the past 30 days. And so, again, you look at the statistics, but then you think about all of our wonder wonderful children who are the future of this great state, that we need to be up here, we need to be fighting for them. I have to say that um, the people around this table have done an exquisite job, even before this. I've had great relations with the sheriff who's just done phenomenal project opioid. Really, what the Hope for Healing initiative was all about was this is not just a government problem. This is an everybody problem. We need to make sure we're getting the faith-based communities together, the private sector, the nonprofits, because if we're all going in separate roads, we need to coordinate, we need to make sure we're maximizing resources, and we need to make sure that at the end of the day, it's not about the money spent, it's the outcomes. Because if we have positive outcomes, that means that people are living happy, healthy, and productive lives, and that's how we know that we're being successful. So Project Opioid, you guys are doing a good thing, and really um, appreciate what how you're modeling, and um, we kind of didn't really know each other in the beginning, but our, our messages are really, really kind of sinking. So. Um, I could go on forever, but I won't because there are more important people here at the table to talk about what they're seeing. Secretary Popple, I know this hits home for you. You yes, are also a uh, strong advocate for our families and children's across the, children across the state. Um, so uh, talk a little bit about the, the crisis hotline that you're seeing and, and uh, we'll start there. No, oh, absolutely. And thank you for having me. It's an honor to be here. And I too want to thank the media because I think uh, my central theme for today is, you know, we, we have to get the word out that help is available. Um, the resources are there, and there's some alarming trends that we are seeing at the department that, that I want to shine a light on here today and hopefully talk a little bit about. But uh, the, the one we highlighted last week was the decrease to, uh, to the hotline on abuse calls. We see it every summer when school lets out. Um, it's usually a two-month problem. Um, this year, it's you know five and a half, six months. Uh, and so if you think about a child being stuck in that situation for that period of time, it is heartbreaking. It is heartbreaking, and so um, we were happy to to kind of promote the message that, you know, if you see something, you got to say something. We need folks to really look out for our kids, and we we're excited from the child welfare aspect for schools to get back uh, get back going, uh, Governor. So thank you for that. Um, some of the the statistics that we talked about uh, recently, you talked about overdoses, um, you talked about the the CDC survey on on what's going on in terms of mental health. The problem that we're having at the department is we're not seeing a commensurate increase in demand for services. And so we have some of these trend lines going in the wrong direction significantly. Um, but when you look at the folks reaching out for treatment, folks coming in and, and our service networks, and I'll let Maria talk about that in a minute, we're not seeing statewide a, a demand for those services. So that is very concerning to us. Um, it really highlights the need for us to get the word out that help is available. Um, and I don't have a, a degree, and so I'll let you handle this, but you got to think, you know, two, three months in, you go another couple months in, um, the situation's not getting better. Abuse is still happening at the house. It's just not getting reported. The mental health needs are still there. They're probably getting worse. Folks just aren't stepping forward and, and getting the help that they need. So uh, the department is committed um, to trying to get the word out. We do have... Um, a significant uh, investment from the federal government, roughly $5 million, um, to both get the word out, but also bolster our 211 network. So that'll be happening. Uh, governor, in his budget, we got $80 million more in uh, state opioid response grant authority. So to, to really bolster the networks around the state. So we have the resources available. We're making the investments. Uh, we just need the people to reach out or their friends to reach out and really prompt them uh, you know, to step forward and get help. So with that, that's my message for today, First Lady and Governor. It's very important. So thank you for, for shining a light on it. No, thanks. And thanks for all your hard work. Um, Tim, thanks for hosting us. Do uh, you want to make some comments? I'd be happy to. Thank you again for being here and, and the support of our Hope and Healing Center, which is a, a joint program with the Sheriff's Department and the County EMS to have an alternative after folks get caught in an overdose situation. Where do they go? And they often find themselves at the, at the emergency department. And we've realized over the last couple of years that we can't just take care of the physical 
uh, urgent acute issue, we have to take care of the whole person. That, that's really what we're looking at. And so we've implemented and deployed SUD navigators, substance use disorder navigators, to embrace these folks and try to help them find some of these services and, and get connected to get on a path uh, for wholeness and wellness. And the Hope and Healing Center will be another resource, hoping later in the year that we're, we'll be able to um, be, be part of that, uh, that series of services. We have seen an increase, uh, as everybody else. COVID has brought uh, a lot of isolation to people. Our SUD navigators have seen about a 30% increase in the individuals that they've seen who've come into the ED with substance abuse. And we see that as a symptom of mental illness because we know that mental illness is driving a lot of the, the factors that people are, are using those substances. So it's been an acute problem, but our, our collaboration is really uh, has some momentum and we look forward to continuing to work on that. Uh, but we do appreciate the support. All, all of these things together as we pull together, we can do it um, with a level of resources that's already there in the community by just networking and leveraging the strength of each other. So we appreciate working with the, the county. Great, well, thanks. Um, Simone, you wanna go? Um, been uh, just a fantastic uh, secretary, really uh, promotes accountability and is uh, does it in a very, very effective way. So floor is yours. Thank you, Governor, uh, First Lady. Thank you all for inviting me to the table to talk about this very important issue. Of course, you know, from DJJ's perspective, it's a little bit of a different um, lens, right, that uh, I look through when I'm talking about substance, substance abuse and mental health issues. Um, you know, when I look across my residential commitment programs, 33% of my kids have substance abuse issues. 55% of them have mental health issues. Now, while mental health is not a risk factor for criminal behavior, and I wanna make sure that everybody hears that loud and clear, substance use and substance abuse is a risk factor for criminal and delinquent behavior. And so as we're talking about how we're going to help our citizens and our families and our children, as we're coming out of this you know, COVID period where people are not interacting, kids have not been in school, they can't go to their after school programs and things like that, you know, my call to arms is gonna be, let's make sure that we are trying to the best of our ability in all of our prevention efforts to educate kids to catch these issues early on because we know that these are factors that very well could lead these children years from now to become one of what I call my kids. And uh, Mrs. DeSantis, you said it very well when you were speaking just now that these children are our future. And so we have to take care of them right now to make sure that they don't go down the path to ruination, you know, for forgive the hyperbole, but really we do. And so I'm happy to be part of this conversation. Great. Well, thanks for all your hard work. Uh, Maria Bledsoe, uh, you want to weigh in? I know you've seen uh, seen a lot uh, since since March in terms of you know how, how things have evolved. So love your perspective. Thank you, Governor and First Lady Advent Health for sponsoring this, Mr. Secretary. Yes, from um, as, mis as um, Mr. Secretary indicated, the numbers for us are are not there. However, the acuity is, is a concern for our system of care. I would like to stress that my, the system of care that I manage is for the uninsured population. So we don't have the perspective from the population that is insured. That's a, a different dynamic. But as individuals have been isolated for six, seven months now, there's factors that go, there's stressors, anxiety, children that have not been with their friends. So we understand that this is gonna be something that's going to evolve and what it's gonna look like over the course of the next potential six months, especially as schools start to open and really working together as partnerships. In our community, we have a great public-private partnership that's going on. And I think that that's going to help as we continue down this path, as the state, as school continues to open in each of the regions. So from our perspective, as Mr. Secretary indicated, we do have the resources and we're asking individuals that look in your areas, look for services and, and reach out. Thank you, Mr. Great. Sheriff, thanks for all uh, your hard work. 
Well, thank you so much for uh, being here, Governor, First Lady. We always welcome you back here to Seminole County to engage in really, really meaningful dialogue. And I want to thank all of our media partners, many of which uh, I consider friends who actually cover a lot of these underlying conditions that are present that lead people down the path in the first place. And, you know, one of the number one questions that I get is, hey, you're a sheriff, you're a part of the criminal justice system. Why are you partnering with the hospitals and the doctors? Because we recognize that people typically don't wake up one day and say that they want to have a, a, a career criminal path. It's typically it's these underlying conditions that need to be addressed that make our community safe, but more importantly, save lives. Before this relationship we've had with Tim Cook, people would typically be taken to the emergency room for overdosing and then be released back into the same environment that they overdosed in the first place. Increasing the likelihood of overdosing and dying by, by about 800%. We said enough is enough. We, we have to get involved. We have to collaborate and partner with a group of individuals because it is our collective responsibility to preserve and protect human life. And if we're not careful, uh, the narrative of bending the curve and all of these things that we've heard for the past six months loses our focus on what lingers around the corner for us tomorrow. And that is an unprecedented uh, substance abuse and mental health crisis, particularly affecting those most vulnerable of population, our children. Uh, we've seen that decrease, just like the secretary st said. We've seen the decrease here in Seminole County, and, and uh, it is terribly concerning because it is only because they're not coming in contact with those mandatory first responders and reporters. We've seen domestic violence flatten out, and I can only imagine if you've been a victim of domestic violence in your home and you were away at work for 40 hours a week where you had the opportunity to report your level of victimization, it has only gotten worse um, uh, through, through this pandemic. And then, of course, our children with, with not only uh, moving to a cyber environment, which welcomes in a whole new way for people to victimize. Uh, we're trying to teach parents that if your children are now have this online footprint that they normally did not have, there's people out there that will absolutely prey on the vulnerable, and we need to make sure that that does not occur. And it's not always that cell phone and, and the text messaging app that we use. It's TikTok and all of these other influencers that are a big um, part of that. So what we've done is we've pulled together this unprecedented group of individuals that come together and, and collaborate. And I think that we are demonstrating the best model practice as we move forward. None of this would happen without your leadership and inspiration, because I know from working with you and the First Lady for the past two years, this was your vision in the very beginning. This is why the First Lady put hope and healing effort together. This is why by executive order, you created the opioid task force for the state and really, really pulled these things together. But when we look at these numbers, especially here in Seminole County, I want to remind everyone, Seminole is one of the most affluent counties in the state, third most densely populated per square mile. But we lose more than 80 people every single year to an opioid related overdose. There's a more than 50% increase in overdoses and more than a 15% increase in overdose deaths when almost everybody has now access to Narcan, which is saving lives. We deploy Narcan more than 400 times in this county per year. Or another way to put that, we bring people back to life uh, 400 times. It is, uh, it is a big challenge that lies ahead, but I am confident by partnering with faith-based organizations, our public and private partnership, the business community, and our media partners that we can get the message out there and be prepared before this crisis hits our front doors any larger than what it has already done. Well, thanks. Thanks for your uh, hard work. And um, I'm going to turn it over in a sec uh, to Dr. Patani, who works in the ED. But I think it is important also to stress in terms of messaging that uh, if somebody's out there that needs any type of medical care, um, and obviously we're talking about here with, um, you know, with drug abuse, um, talking a little bit broadly about mental health, but things like heart and stroke. Um, this is a safe place to come and to get care. And we've seen declines in that in March and April. People were fearful about coming in due to coronavirus. Some thought that the hospitals didn't have any space based on, I think, um, uh, false narratives. But um, this is a place where, where you come, they, they uh, follow all kinds of procedures. And so if you're concerned about coronavirus in a hospital, 
um, you should probably be concerned about just about everywhere else you would be because you have probably a higher chance of getting it there uh, than here. Um, and that said, uh, we'll turn it over uh, to Dr. Patani. Thank you, Gov Thank you, Governor and First Lady, Secretary, and distinguished panel here, Sheriff Lima. Um, what you said is spot on, Governor DeSantis, which is uh, the healthcare industry has, um, over the past six months, evolved a way we can take care of patients. But more importantly than that, we usually refer to multidisciplinary uh, as cardiology or gastroenterology or people help take care of patients. This is the true multidisciplinary approach to how we take care of patients. Um, we provide them a safe place to seek care, whether you have mental substance abuse issues or whether you have um, cardiology issues. Um, the message to really uh, keep augmenting and, and supplement with the community is that the healthcare arena is a safe place. Um, we have established best practices, both from clinical protocols, but more importantly, also from safety and per, uh, infection prevention um, perspectives. So when we come and we have to deal with patients and patients have to come to the hospital to, to receive care, we, they, everyone needs to understand the community at large, it is one of the safest places right now to go to for help. Um, in the mental health uh, substance abuse industry or, or, or patient population, um, we refer to COVID-19 in, in many industries as a dis disruptor. You know, whether it's financial uh, or farming and agriculture, uh, in healthcare, the disruption is uh, we saw a paucity in some healthcare that was being sought after. Um, we're seeing a resurgence and a returning of our chronic care patient populations, of which, of which the mental health population is one of them. And that's extremely important because we need people to feel comfortable and safe. And we want people to understand that we're not here just for your physical well-being, but we're here for your mental well-being. And I think that's a keynote for our patients. Yeah, no, thank you so much. Um, really appreciate it. Uh, Lieutenant Heath, um, we really appreciate all the work you're doing. Enjoyed uh, getting to um, brief on some of the stuff you're doing. So if you could talk a little bit about that, we'd appreciate it. Yes, and thank you, Governor and First Lady, for having this panel. I'm so very, very excited to hear about your endeavors, and especially with the Hope and Healing Project, because I know better than anybody that our juvenile population if they fall through those cracks, then they end up in my correctional facility. So um, speaking of the people in my correctional facility, um, we've just recently started the ACT program about a year and a half ago, which is accepting change through treatment. It supports our opiate epidemic, trying to help those individuals combat that substance abuse problem. And one of the things that we recently added to that was our community navigator. And what that community navigator is going to do is support those individuals to remain successful once they reenter into the community. So that's our focus right now. But with the support of the sheriff, we've been doing tremendous work inside of the correctional facility. And I hope that COVID doesn't stop us or prevent us from continuing that work. Great. Thanks so much. Uh, Andre Bailey, CEO of Project Opioid. Uh, you know, thanks for all that you've been doing on this. And and as, as I had mentioned, it, um, you know, some of this stuff has f fell off kind of the front burner and the public consciousness, but uh, the problem didn't fall off um, and didn't go away. And now we're dealing with even more challenges. And so I, I appreciate you being in that fight. Governor, uh, First Lady, thank you so much for your leadership here. Uh, Tim, as always, you and your team at Advent Health uh, are the best. And we have the, uh, uh, the best sheriff in, in Florida here with Dennis Lima. Um, someone who's uh, fighting the good fight for those in need in this community and really around the state. Uh, my message and the leaders at Project Opioid, business and faith leaders who are involved in the mental health uh, addiction and opioid crisis is that everyone should be very, very scared of the data that they're seeing on mental health addiction and the uh, overdose crisis here in Florida, uh, in Central Florida and really around America. You know, we throw around the term unprecedented, words like unprecedented a lot in our society. Words have less value because we use them. That was an unprecedented set of nachos I had last <laughs> night. They were delicious. But when you look at the data, so the first lady just said that if you have an 18-year-old to a 24-year-old in this room, I have two of them. I have a 19-year-old daughter and a 20-year-old daughter. There's a 50% chance, a coin flip, that one of my daughters contemplated suicide in the last few months. If you're in this room, 
and you have a kid anywhere in that age, that is unprecedented. And we have to admit as a community, as a state, and a, as a nation, that COVID-19 and the lockdowns that we decided to do, uh, let the historians tell the story of whether that was right or wrong, I'm not here to do that, but I am here to say that we are facing an unprecedented mental health, addiction, and overdose crisis, and that um, as great as government is as shut at shutting society down, only the business community, the faith community, and all of us together can engage at our living rooms, in our living rooms, at our dining room tables, at our places of work, at our places of worship, to have this conversation and to look towards getting people help. Governor, uh, First Lady, I think a lot of folks aren't accessing treatment um, in a way because if you reach out for something that's not medically related to COVID-19, maybe you feel bad that, um, I know a lot of people that just feel bad to even talk about mental health issues right now. Um, so I think just starting the dialogue, not about canceling the conversation that we've had about COVID-19 and, and the medical importance, what we've done as, as a society medically is important, and, and I won't take that away, but we've got to add to that dialogue the fact that the data says we could see an unprecedented wave of mental health issues, anxiety, depression, suicide, overdoses, and deaths in the months and years to come. And um, if we're not talking about it, if we're not planning for how we're gonna address it, we could see a loss of life in those areas that maybe far exceeds even what we saw medically from COVID-19. So we're, we're so thankful for your leadership and um, it starts with a conversation and uh, we're here to support you any way we can. And you, um uh, attribute uh, kind of the change with these 18, is, uh, just the social isolation and some of the things that have happened. Obviously, probably some of them have... have uh... I like Chad. I'm going to say I don't have a degree in this, but let me quote Dr. Phil Toll, who is uh, one of the behavioral health leaders at Aspire, where he told me uh, we were shooting up some videos on mental health a few weeks ago, and he said, you know, Andre, in, in our circles, in mental health circles, we believe that 40%, up to 40% of Americans will have post-traumatic stress disorder when these quarantines are done. 40%. This is not, this was not at a press conference. This was just him and I talking because he said, you know, Andre, for the record, we've never shut society down before. We never shut the world down. We, I mean, you know, I'm just happy to be here because I haven't been out of my pajamas in three months. So, um, but as a society, we've, uh, Governor, we've never... This is a social experiment that we've never done before and that our mental health professionals believe whether or not it was necessary or not, again, I'm not, trying to, I'm not trying to say that, but our mental health professionals believe that the consequences to mental health, substance abuse and addiction, that the data is, it's unquestionable that those are skyrocketing now. Yeah, and look, I think that you, know, you can say that COVID's the most important thing in the world. It doesn't mean that you don't also look at how that uh, approach is affecting other things. And so, for example, we uh, very early on, you know, we, we stopped access to nursing homes because we were concerned about the virus going in. Uh, and we did a bunch of other stuff, acquired PPE, sent PPE testing, created COVID-only nursing homes. And we've done a lot to protect that vulnerable population. Um, and, it's, and it has saved lives, but it also has had big costs in terms of loneliness, uh, mental anguish. The families aren't able to go in um, and, 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 and visit their loved ones. And we have people, we focus on, on COVID, but I mean, you know, there's people that pass away in nursing homes from, from, from natural causes or other, other causes. And, um, and, and they may not have had the family members in there. That, that leaves a lasting mark. Um, Advent, I think, has been really good because uh, I think they've recognized this. And like a, a lot of the hospitals just weren't allowing the visitors. But for these kind of critical, you know, end of life situations, they've allowed the, the family members to come in. And I think that that's something that's uh, that, that, that's that was a, that's a very good decision. I think it sees the whole picture and, and understands that, um, that that those types of interactions are, are critical. And, and to deny that from a family, it's hard enough to lose a loved one, but then to not be able to be there and to say goodbye, those that leaves lasting scars. Uh, and so I think what you've been able to do is is really you know take a tough situation. And, and at least mitigate some of the collateral damage from it. And so uh, I've uh, 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 
advocated for all our hospitals in Florida to, to follow suit. I know some have, uh, some of the systems have, but I think that that's something you know that's very important. And I, I, another thing I think just in terms of the uh, how the society has changed is you know when we're talking about the kids. You know, the, the kids can develop, um, uh, you know, you know, mental health problems, substance abuse, you know, because the parents are, are, are really stressed. You know, the parents may lose jobs or have something really negative, and then that trickles down. So, obviously, we concern about the parent. If they have problems, we want them to seek, seek help and use the resources, but that can also trickle down to, to, the, to the younger generation. And, um, I, Tim, you made a point about, um, you know, back before we came out here about how uh, we, we, we can't just view infection or not as kind of what, what safety means. Can you, can you talk about that here and, uh, and sure. make that point? Well, I was, I was referencing the fact that right now when we talk about safe to come to the hospital, everybody's thinking about everything's clean, people are wearing masks, so you're not getting a COVID infection. But in the world of mental health, there's got to be a psychological safety because people are afraid to let people know. They're afraid they might go to jail because of the stigma that we've put on it, some of the things you, you were talking about. So I think as we continue the dis discussion and, and allow people to understand that this is an illness that people care about and it's key to your wholeness in your life. You, you, the physical infection of COVID is important, but if your mental health is off, uh, that's going to have a, a negative impact on your overall wholeness of health. So I think engaging and promoting this kind of discussion begins to allow a sense of psychological safety that people will hopefully take better access of the, of the services that are there. And so Chad um, and, and Marie, if you want to, I mean, are you guys, um, you know, confident in the resources that are there? And is it, is it really the most important thing, just getting the message out and, and telling people that they, they need to, that they have the ability to access and they should access? Governor, thank you for the question. I'll start and I'll kick it over to you. Um, one of the things we're really proud of at, at the at the agency is through the entirety of COVID, we our networks have not lost the ability to provide service in any part of the state. We've had facilities and different things, you know, have a COVID positive issue, and but we've been able to resource and we've been very nimble on the ground, and that's a big testament to the leadership of our managing entities. So I feel very confident at this point, um, having gone through all of that, that the network's in very good shape. We do have capacity. Um, you provided additional resources in the budget. So in my mind, yes, the message and getting the word out, getting folks to kind of rally around folks in their lives they know have issues and encourage them to, to seek help is the number one thing. But I'll kick it over to Maria. Governor, um, in the, initially in March, when the, especially the first two weeks of COVID, whereas we really transformed an entire network from face-to-face -to, -face to telehealth and how quickly the network, we worked with our, our providers, our partners in the community, and also the partners around this table to change from a face-to-face -face model to a telehealth model. Medication-assisted treatment has specific requirements from week to week, month to month, how that evolved from what we refer to as a drive-by so that individuals could still continue to get the delivery of the services. So there wasn't an interruption in the delivery of any of the services in our system of care across the state. That has always been there and always available for individuals to access. Um, as we continue to move forward over the course of the next several, four, six months, it'll be interesting as, as the services can get accessed. Again, we have services. We're asking people that if you do need services to reach out. The, the anxiety, the social isolation, the, the suicide ideations, we ask people to really seek out for services. Uh, we are here to help. Um, the state funds those services so that we can provide it for individuals. Yeah, it seems like um, you know, overall the telehealth has been been a big positive, but but it but it does have limitations on some of the uh, treatments that are needed in certain um, in certain avenues, and some of the mental health stuff I, I think is probably one of them. Yes, we've actually gotten very creative in the delivery of the various services. Uh, individuals, some individuals weren't open to the telehealth concept, so we have offered them hybrid. We've offered them the ability to do, still do the face-to-face, -face, whether it could be done at a park, outside, outside of their homes, so that there is no interruption in the delivery of the service. So that we have gotten very creative in, in ensuring that people continue their 
care because that is very critical, especially for mental health services and substance use. And, and I think that as we continue to evolve, there are gonna be changes. As we work with Advent Health in the Sud SUDNEP program, I think that is gonna be very instrumental because as this starts to open up, what does it look like when we do open it? Or, you know, you may have a vision, it may change but you have to be very flexible. This is, these are times when flexibility is very important to ensure continuity of care. Uh, Sheriff, how's the, just the general uh, community uh, been doing, like, you know, how's, how's crime been? Have you seen a change uh, since, since March, April in terms of any specific types of crimes either going up or going down? Yeah, so uh, Governor, statistically, uh, crime is down. Uh, you know, it's down across the state of Florida and in the 107 year history, it's never been as low in Seminole County as it is today. What's frightening about that is criminologists suggest that a fraction of the crime that occurs in our community is actually ever reported to law enforcement. And you can just think for a moment of all of those uh, victims of abuse, neglect, or abandonment that are pre-verbal, that yeah. fall at the hands of their caregiver, that nobody knows about it, or the amount of domestic violence that occurs. And so, so we're seeing that, and I think it's a blessing because it allows us to look at some of these more complex social issues that we need to address. Even when we talk about the overdoses, I think it's important to mention this. When we talk about overdoses, we reference that in overdoses and overdose deaths. Right. When the fact is, is most people who are using don't overdose. <laughs> That's just a fraction. These are the most severe cases. Right. But, um, you know, it, it's, it's incredibly frightening uh, to look at all of these effects, everything that we've heard, I think that rarely do you see us all from our various worlds coming together and actually saying the same thing. I don't know that we could be more aligned on, on what the challenges are and what we need to do as a society, all as aspects of society, to get us out of this. You have any? Yeah, well, and, and very quickly in talking with a lot of psychologists across the state and, and just really, uh, you know, picking their brain, uh, and they talk to me sometimes about the mitigation efforts, and, and they'll say, uh, realize that there is a value to them, and we understand that, but let's also look at this holistically on the other side, and that being when you're wearing a facial covering or a mask, there is something, you're hiding a smile. And when you smile at somebody or somebody smiles at you, there's serotonin and dopamine that get released into your brain and those are happy chemicals and that makes you feel good. So that's been taken away. You talk about social distancing. There's something to touch. When you touch somebody, there is a serotonin and dopamine chemical that's released to the brain. That's what's, what studies will tell you. That also increases your mood and helps with mental health. Isolation is not something that's great. If you're depressed, being around other people and being able to talk and to vent and to get things off your, that has been taken away. So you just need to look at this holistically and understand that there are ramifications and implications for mitigation efforts. And I've heard that from um, psychologists and, and whatnot that I've been speaking to across the state. What do you think about like businesses? I mean, um, what's there? I mean, obviously we obviously have viewed the private sector as being important. This has been a disruption the last uh, a few months. Um, you know, what, what is their role? Is it going to be the same as it was, or are they going to have to change some of the, some of their approach? I think the business community, uh, the faith community and others, they have really the greatest opportunity to be a direct connect to families. Um, you know, when you talk about, uh, anything related to government, I think it's more complicated. It's, you know, there's a lot of issues that go with, uh, putting new programs in government, uh, just common sense, uh, limitations there. But when a business owner, uh, you know, the CEO of Red Lobster, Kim Lopdrop, wanted to be here today, he, he couldn't be here. He's based out of Orlando. He wanted to get uh, education around Narcan to his 63,000 employees. He called Jewel Taylor, their HR director, and said, make this happen. And within a few days, uh, their employees through their uh, HR department and their EAP program got new access that they didn't have before. So I think it's going to be key, uh, Governor and First Lady, um, that we engage a new front line, especially in a time when people, the thing that scares me the most that I've heard today is that less people are reaching out for service because the numbers around people in need are skyrocketing. And if people are not reaching out for help, that means we are creating a, a really um, a situation where 2021 
could be a very frightening year from a mental health addiction, uh, societal uh, standpoint. So the business community and the faith community has to start a conversation that then tr to their employees, to their parishioners, that then happens, um, trickles down to the family. I'm gonna go home, I'm telling you right now, I'm gonna go home, I'm gonna leave this wonderful press conference and I'm gonna go talk to my daughters. I'm, I'm not kidding, I'm gonna talk to my daughters again about how you doing, I see that, I do this all the time, but I'm concerned now, again, after hearing that stat, no one can talk to my daughters like their father, but sometimes it takes a business, your employer, your faith leader, or someone in your world to give you the information you need. So I think they can be critical, and I think they often are overlooked, and, and that's why we think that's important. Great. Any other parting shots? Anyone else uh, have anything? <laughs> so I think I need to take one. And it's not so much a parting shot, but it's, you know, a couple of thoughts that, I, that I'm having here as a secretary of DJJ as I listen to a lot of what I'm hearing. And a comment that you made um, earlier, Mr. Cook, when you were talking about, and I think I uh, heard something as well, that during this, the pandemic, uh, you know, many of my prevention providers and, you know, residential commitment providers as well, but many of my prevention providers have necessarily had to move from in-person um, contact with the at-risk kids that they serve to tech, you know, technology-based. And I had a conversation um, with one the other day. Actually, it was I was talking to a group that included a, provide, a prevention provider of mine. And he asked if I, meaning DJJ, um, I'm going to change our programmatic requirements after COVID passes. And we know that it will pass. And what I said to him was, look, we're talking about children here. They need face-to-face -face contact. So it's okay to take away the best practices in using technology as we're serving these children, but we can't completely migrate to that and think that we're gonna be effective because as you said, first lady, children need to be seen. They need to, they're gonna need that contact. They, they're going to need that. And so I, um, you know, in my, uh, in my role to, as par partially holding my providers accountable, I'm gonna make sure that at the right time that migration back to face-to-face -to -face interactions um, happens. And I'm certain that that will start happening once schools fully reopen and those referrals start you know, rolling in and things like that. But I, but I think that's gonna be an important piece to making sure that these kids remain healthy and out of trouble. Great. Uh, well, I wanna thank everybody for, uh, for what you're doing. Uh, thank you for participating today. I think we we know that we're in for um, you know a long road ahead, uh, but I think the fact that we're here, uh, recognizing some of these trends, and and committed uh, to to be to be a part of the solution, and I think you guys you know have have done a lot already and had a good framework in place. Uh, this this is kind of this pandemic has just kind of thrown some things uh, sideways, but um, but we got to work hard to get it to get it back, uh, get those trends back in a better direction, and I know that we can do that. Um, and finally, I'd just say the, um, you know, we had a primary election yesterday. Uh, we had worked hard, Secretary of State, uh, helping the supervisors, you know, with making sure their systems were good. And, um, you know, I think that they did a really good job. Uh, we're ready to, to do it. Um, you know, we'll learn if there was anything to do, offer additional support uh, in, before the general election. We did, uh, had a lot of mail voting, you know, in Florida. You know, it's a safe way to do it. You request the ballot, you get it, you send it in. It's not just ballots floating everywhere. Uh, so a lot of folks availed themselves of that, and that obviously will be uh, something that will be uh, available uh, in the fall as well.